scripture is more of a mirror into your life than it is a window into somebody else's. Yeah. So the problem is, is that we have a PhD in everybody else's sin, but a GED in our own. And so we need scripture to function as a mirror because when we allow it to, it becomes a sword that divides bone and marrow and it confronts our own idolatry. It confronts the idolatry of identity. Like this idea that we get to have our own separate, unique, self-determined identity after coming to Christ. No, you don't. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. You gave up the right to self-determine. You on. gave up the right to self-identify. You gave up the right to choose your own pathology. You gave up the right to be terminally unique. You gave up the right to Google your symptoms and then say that you have a disease that you've never been diagnosed with. You gave up your right to reframe your sexuality around your abuse. You gave up your right. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. And God will not share the throne of your heart with any other idol. Well, it's a good day. And it's always fun when there's a surprise, right? Come on, like, it's a surprise day. And uh, it's, a, it's just a joy to have you here, man. We're, we're honored by your presence and uh, think so much of your ministry and what God is working through pursuit. And it, lest there be people in the room and even at the Joplin campus, everybody, who are streaming in, there be people in the room who are like not super familiar with pursuit or you. I kind of wanted to start with like a personal question. So you're from, you hail from a ministry family, like early, you kind of like got involved in some politics and then out of that, you got called into ministry and then you planted pursuit. And I don't know, I may be, I may be muddying the water in terms of that trajectory, but kind of tell us, tell the, tell the people about your family, how you got called into ministry, kind of catch us up to speed on who you are, what you're about. Yeah, it's such a privilege to be here and just see and sense what uh, God is doing in this room. It's, it's, it's really awe-inspiring. It's incredible. Uh, I, yeah, I grew up in a, in a ministry family. Uh, my dad was in uh, Christian higher ed for many years, and uh, we grew up in a non-denominational Pentecostal church in Seattle. And uh, maybe for some, some of you, you have similar stories you've experienced that, you know, in politics, we have this term called rhino, which means Republican in name only. And I think in uh, the church, we have uh, Pinos, Pentecostals in name only, you know. And so, you know, we have these kind of, um, you know, Pentecostal theology, but not a lot of Pentecostal practice. And so it's, it's a form of godliness that denies the power there within. And so I just, I, I grew up believing all of this stuff, but you kind of ask the question that John Wimber would ask, when do we get to do this stuff? Like, we've heard about it. We've heard the stories, but... When is God going to give us a story of our own? And I think, honestly, that, that's the seedbed. You know, that's, that's the question that motivates revival is when does God give us a story of our own? And so I think oftentimes, like nostalgia, uh, honor is great, but nostalgia is deadly. And so, like, I love the stories of what God has done through the Pentecostal movement, through the launching of Azusa Street and, you know, all these types of things. And, and, but sometimes you can get so caught up in honoring what God did that church becomes a museum of what God did in the past instead of a laboratory of what God wants to do in the present or in the future. And so there was this like kind of question that I started to wrestle with even when I was young. I was like, I've heard all of the stories and you get tired of people talking about the good old days. Like, like it's the reverse of the wedding of Cana. You serve the best wine at first and you save the junk for us. And I'm just like, but that's not the pattern of the way that God works. You know, there's greater things to come. There's greater things that God wants to do. And so... When I was like 11 or 12 years old, it was in like, I think it was in 95. I was born in 86, but it was in 95 uh, that there was this outbreak of revival at this Assemblies of God Church in Brownsville, Florida. And um, I'm dating myself a little bit, but there used to be this thing back in the day called VHS, videotapes. And so uh, we had heard who, about- Who doesn't know what a VHS is? <laughs> hey. Hey, you're in, you're in, oh, I'm in good just company, got, hey, so. that's brave, man. I appreciate that. I break that off of you now in Jesus' name. I just, <laughs> and so we heard about this revival that was happening in Florida. And so uh, my dad started to order the VHS videotapes from Brownsville. And so we would watch them at my house. And I was like, you know, there comes a time in your life where you want something more than you've ever wanted anything else. And for me, that's revival. And so I want revival in my day, but reformation in my lifetime. And I think that's how revival becomes multi-generational is when you marry the revival of a moment to the reformation of a life. And so I begin to see these things coming out of Brownsville and it was strange and it was odd and it was controversial, but you never get oil without controversy. It just doesn't happen. 
And so I saw this and I was like, man, if God can do it in Brownsville, God can do it for us. And so it kind of began this lifelong pursuit, this desire, this, this thing that, you know, searching inside of me for, um, for, that, for that living water. And then say somehow, I, I don't know how it ended up, but I, um, I, uh, we ended up in, uh, in the political space doing public policy work. And um, I thought, you know, maybe this is the redemptive work that God has for me. And I, I like politics and I still like politics today. I'm still relatively involved. We just started a political action committee actually at our church and trying to flip some school board races and things like that. But I just, I was like, all right, I guess this is what I'm going to do, uh, do with my life. And, and I was happy to do it. And I got recruited out of the political space by an AG pastor named Pastor Joe Featon from uh, our area. And he called me. I was about 25 years old. He said, what are you going to do with, when you grow up? And I said, well, I am growing up. I'm working in politics. <laughs> and he said, no, I see something on you. And that's the value. You know, Paul tells Timothy, you have many teachers, but you have few fathers. And fathers have the ability to see in you what you don't see in you. Wow. And so oh, he saw something in me. And it's interesting because even in the final letter that, you know, Paul writes Timothy before Paul's untimely death by the hands of the Roman government, he says, I saw faith in your grandmother, Lois. And I saw it in your mother, Eunice, and I am convinced it lives in you. And that's why I love programs like this, Bible colleges like this, ministry training schools like this, because what you're going to do is you're going to get around fathers in the faith who see things in you, and they're able to call it out. See, don't take faith to call out the dirt. Everybody has it. It takes faith to call out the gold. And I love Paul writing from a prison cell to an insecure pastor in the city of Ephesus, and Timothy will eventually give his life for the same gospel as well. But he's like, I'll never be with you again. I wish I could. I'm with you in tears. Remember me in my chains. I wish I was there, but I'm not. But remember, Timothy, when I found you and you had a, a Jew, Jewish mom and a Greek daddy and you was just an uncircumcised young man living on your couch and I took you on to missionary journeys, the same thing I saw in you back then, I see in you today. I see faith. And he had a father in the faith who called it out and that's what Pastor Joe did to me. He said, what do you want to do when you grow up? I see something in you. He said, well, would you come lead this young adult ministry at our church? And it's only part-time. They pay me $1,200 a month. And would you come in on the weekends and lead our young adult ministry? And I thought, well, I can still do politics and do this on the weekend. And so I did. And uh, I showed up in our first young adult meeting, God is my witness. We had three young people. And um, now I already work in conservative politics in Washington State. So I'm already a glutton for pain. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm used to losing. And so I... <clears throat> But I told my wife on the way home from our first young adult meeting, I said, you know, um, I get paid more than this in politics to be embarrassed, you know. And so I said, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if this is, this is for me. We were church people. We love Jesus. You know, we grew up, when you grow up in a ministry family, you're at church more than God's at church, you know, four or five, six times a week, you're at church. So this was not like, I wasn't deconstructing, you know. I wasn't like ah, backsliding. It was just like, maybe this isn't for me. And, and she was like, would you give it a month? She's like, don't be that guy who takes something for a week and then gives up. Mm. And I was like, all right, you know, all right. And so, um, you know, I asked the Lord, I said, um, if you will show yourself strong, if you will be our God, we will be your people. But I'm not, I'm not signing up to manage the aquarium. I'm signing up to fish in the deep. I can't, I can't just, you know... <laughs> I can't just give in to the nostalgia of what was. I mean, I love, I love what was. I love, I grew up with the revival history in Toronto's and the Brownsville's and, and you know, the stuff that, you know, uh, has happened around the nation, the outbreaks of God. But what it creates is this like longing ache in your heart. Like, God, you got to do it for me. Like, when are you going to give me a story of my own? And I think my, my life has been marked by like Luke 11, where Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray. And I'm so shook by this. Out of all the things that, that, that the disciples see, what they ask Jesus to do is not teach them how to do miracles. They say, teach us how to pray. Yeah. So he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. And after the Lord's Prayer, he goes into this phenomenal analogy about a man who goes to his friend's house at midnight to ask for bread. And the, the, the friend responds, we're in bed. My kids are asleep. Come back tomorrow. And he keeps knocking and he keeps knocking and he keeps knocking. And finally, the Bible says, not because of friendship, but because of bold audaciousness, yeah. he will get up from his sleep and give this man bread. And I feel like that's, my life has been marked by this bold, foolish audaciousness to keep asking. And then Jesus concludes that story by saying, ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be opened unto you. And Jesus spoke these things concerning what? The Holy Spirit. And so my wife was like, listen, give it a month and see what God would do. 
And uh, I said, all right. And the next week, it was more of the same. I think we went from like three to four. And, uh, you know, it was like in those settings, your favorite verses where two or three are gathered. There I am in your midst, you know, and that's like, what's my life verse where two or three are gathered. And I felt like the Lord said, you know, if you if you ask, I will come. If you ask, if you have the bold audaciousness to ask. And see, what happens in life is, you know, the older you get, the more that you have to deal sometimes with the own missed expectations in your own heart. And oftentimes what it does is the enemy works overtime to shut down your ability to ask. Because every time you ask, you're opening yourself up for injury. Because what if it doesn't happen like I wanted it to? Or what if the answer is different than my preconceived idea or notion? And when, 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 when you deal with the injury of asking, you know, it, it, it really causes you to, to be reflective and honest and transparent even in your own heart. But here's what I found. The cross doesn't eliminate my pain. It gives purpose to it. <clears throat> and so the more I look at the cross, the more I realize is that God works oftentimes through the avenue of pain and injury to help show himself strong. Not that God is the author of our pain, but if we let him, he'll use it. And so I'm dealing with this injury of asking, of growing up in a very historic Pentecostal church, and I love my upbringing, I love my roots. We were the first, you know, Philadelphia church where I was raised was the first tongue-talking church in Washington after Azusa. And, and, and I loved it, and I loved the heritage, but, you know, by the time that we was being raised in it, it was like, where's the wind? Where's the oil? You know, where, like, do all we have is, is history? Is there a future, you know? And so I'm like, I don't even want to ask God, but my wife was like, just, just, Give it a month. Don't be that dude. And so um, I'll never forget our fourth and last Sunday. I was kind of like checking it off like an advent calendar of failure. You know, like let me get four weeks in and and let me resign and go back to politics. And uh, we were having this little young adult service in the cafe of Cedar Park Church in Bothell, Washington. And had a dude playing acoustic guitar, no sound system, no LED screens, nothing. (laughs) And a kid who could kind of sing halfway on tune. And um, we began to worship, and the Spirit of God fell in that place in ways that I can't explain. And over the next number of months, that young adult ministry would grow by hundreds as people started driving from other states, coming down from Canada just to be a part of just this, like, awakening. And um, you know what's so great about God is that he makes us look a lot better than we actually are. And God was in the midst of it, and he did something incredible, and we did that for three years. And and the wind of God would blow, and it was messy, and it was controversial, and we didn't get it right most of the time. But what God honored was an audacious willingness to ask. And I think sometimes for us, and like I believe in theology, we need good systematic theology, and you need to know what you believe and believe what you know and doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs, and, and I'm for that, and I believe all of that. But I think sometimes in our, you know, because we're, 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 we, we are byproducts of the Enlightenment in the West, and we have this kind of existential search and need for like the acclimation of knowledge and wisdom and facts, and we, we, we have all of these facts in the American church about Jesus, but... but when is the last time that we allowed the Holy Spirit to have his church? You know, like it's his church. And so God showed up and made a mess of the whole thing. And we learned a lot. And three years in, our lead pastor was getting ready to transition out. He'd been there faithfully for many decades. And that led us to the season of planting pursuit. Wow. So it's a great story. Yeah, Come sorry. on. Come on. So I, I have a number of questions that will be spawned out of that answer. But one of them would be based on kind of one of the taglines that I, I would guess defines or, or maybe, I don't, maybe define isn't the right word. You can speak to that. But one of the taglines that it's associated with pursuit is revival or we die. Yeah. Um, that, I mean, it's on a sign in your lobby. Yeah. It's something that if you follow pursuit at all, you know that, that you're going to hear that phrase. Why is that phrase? Because it seems like there are things that came out of that personal hunger, longing, desire, and what God did in that season that now have informed the whole church culture in terms of the church you're pastoring. Talk about why that phrase is important and then what what you, by the power of the Holy Spirit and leading the Holy Spirit, are trying to create in the people there. Yeah, and I think it's so important to like, and this has been honestly the challenge of a growing church and, and might be the challenge for some of you in this room, in this awesome explosive church and all of the things that God is doing. It's incredible. The church in your heart always has to remain bigger than the church that you attend. The church in your heart has to remain bigger than the church that you lead. 
Um, because like with David, like what I'm so shook by is after everything he's seen, he's king over the nation, all these types of things. And he's like, one thing have I sought, that which I have desired, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of yeah. your life and to gaze upon your beauty. And my right. conviction in the American church is that we find God useful, but we don't find him beautiful. Oh, come on. <clears throat> And I think it's the beauty of God, the transcendent beauty of God that still captures us again. And it's like we lose our sense of awe, we lose our sense of wonder, sometimes even growing up in charismatic churches because we kind of get used to this environment. And like the question I ask my staff frequently is, does this still move you? Because if it doesn't still move you, the church in your heart is small, but the church you attend is big. And I just feel like it's been this like ongoing journey of the Lord like saying to me, like, Russ, the church in your heart has to grow. Yeah. Your, your desire and your awe and your wonder and, and the beauty of who I am to you and, 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 and what I have shown you and who I am to you has to still be the central obsession of your life. And, you know, for me, I just feel like, um, and God is useful. He's incredibly useful, you know, and he provides and supplies everything that we're in need of according to his riches and glory and his blessing yeah. makes us rich and it adds no sorrow and he forgives all of our sins and heals all of our diseases. And yes, God is incredibly useful. But as soon as he becomes more useful to like the advancement of my career, then he becomes beautiful to my personal pursuit of him. It's like, that's, yeah. that's when part of my spirit's begun to shrivel. And I, I think that the true way to know that you're old is when your memories become more powerful than your dreams. And I feel like sometimes for us, like we lose the ability to keep dreaming yeah. or we feel like we've tapped out or we've capped out or I've, I've, I've checked the box of presence. I've checked the box of revival. And I, and I just feel like this is, this is something we will give ourselves to li lifelong and we will allow other people to adjudicate or determine our success. Because as soon as we buy into the narrative of like we've arrived, there's something inside of us that begins to die. And for me, like when I gather on Sunday, and maybe this is just like the pain of church planting, because honestly, in church planting, every Sunday you show up and you're like, is this the last Sunday that we're going to be around or alive? You know, whatever. <laughs> but I still like sense that like if we <clears throat> if if you get the presence, you get everything else. Yeah. But if you don't get the presence, it doesn't matter what else you get. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. In his presence, there is fullness of life. At his right hand, there is benefit. And for me, it's like the church exists to glorify Jesus. And in doing so, bring people into an encounter with his presence. But if we allow the presence to do the heavy lifting, then in fact, Christ will build his church and the gates of hell cannot, will not, should not prevail against it, which presupposes that the church is not on defense, it's on, on offense. We are not protecting what is. Yeah. We are going after what's next. And so yeah. for on. me, the, the idea of revival or we die, it's, it's rooted in 2 Kings 4, where the prophet Elisha does a very similar miracle to, to, to his mentor, the prophet Elijah. There is a widow whose husband is dead. And uh, she is facing an uncertain future. In fact, her sons are about to be sold into indentured servitude or slavery. And she approaches the prophet and, and he says, what would you have me do for you? And she says, I'm down to my last little drop of oil in the jar. And you guys know the story. He says, go to your neighbors, collect all of the jars, come into your house, shut the doors and windows and watch God multiply it. And what I'm most struck by is the end of that narrative where Elisha tells the widow, sell your oil that your sons may live. And to me, when I think about the oil of encounter, the oil of awakening, the yeah. oil of revival, it is so the next generation can live. Yeah. If we don't have revival, we will lose the next generation to whatever the most popular heresy is on TikTok. We need an encounter with the living God. Without revival, the West is lost. Without awakening, the West is lost. Without encounter, the West is lost. We need an unmitigated, uncool, controversial outpouring of God's Spirit that has a multi-generational effect. And it's more than just a good service. It's more than just an extended weekend. It's more than just, you know, an exciting worship service. I mean, those are all parts of it. Those are all ingredients of it. But I mean, a fire on the altar that does not burn out, that yeah. day and night contends. It's like when, it's like when Hannah was you know, praying for a child in Shiloh and, and the prophet comes to her and says, are you drunk? And she says, no, I'm desperate. Yeah. I don't think God hears prayers as much as he hears desperation. Yeah, wow. She goes, I'm desperate. And you know, your life has not knocked on the threshold of desperation until your lips move with prayers that your mouth cannot utter. And she's, she's, she's just mumbling to the Lord. 
in, 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 in groans and utterances, give me a child, give me a child. And Eli's corrupt and his sons are even worse. And it represents the religious class and the religious corruption of the nation of Israel. And, and, and she, she tells the Lord, she says, if you give me a child, I will, I will give him to the temple. And, and Eli says to her, your request has been heard. She has a boy named Samuel. And the Bible says, and he was raised in the presence of the Lord. And to me, I'm like, that is the high call of God, which is in Christ Jesus on our generation yeah. is that we would raise our kids in revival. And I tell our people this in our church. I say, we are immigrants to revival. We were not born here, but we will raise our kids here. And that is the generational call for us. That is the generational call for our nation is that we raise our kids in revival. Why? Because the religious class is corrupt. Because if religion could have saved America, we would have done already been saved. We need an outpouring of God's spirit. And Samuel becomes a prototype. And so to me, I look at this and I go, what's the oil for? It's so our sons can live. It's so our daughters can live. Because if not, they're getting sold into slavery. And so for me, when I say like revive where we die, it's not like a cute brand or like a logo that we've trademarked. Like that's how I feel like in a place like the Northwest. It ain't a Bible Belt. We don't got mega churches on every corner. It's relatively opposed. I mean, I, I love that you guys are having Bill Johnson. We had Bill Johnson two years ago. They protested. They picketed outside of our church. You got the religious people who hate the move of God. And then you've got the atheists who hate the move of God and the only time that they partner is when they come together to criticize the move of God you know and so <clears throat> it's like what Jesus says he says beware the leaven of the Pharisees which is the religious class and beware the leaven of Herod which is the cultural class when those two leavens get together they produce toxicity in a culture and so you know, for me, I'm just like, when I say revival, we die, I look at the Northwest and I go, we, 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 we are facing an uncertain future. Yeah. But if the Lord would rend the heavens and come down and show himself strong, then what Jesus declared in John 7 would be true. On the last day of the great feast, he stood up and declared with a loud voice, he who believes will receive. And out of his innermost come being on. will flow rivers of living water. And these things Jesus spoke concerning the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given. And you fast forward to Pentecost, Peter preaches and says, what? What is happening here is the fulfillment of what Joel prophesied in years past that God would pour out a spirit on all flesh, young and old, men and women, men servant, maid servant, Jew and Gentile, and the spirit we are one. And on that day, you see an outpouring that, that becomes the prophetic antitype, the fulfillment of the shadow of the old. And what I love about Pentecost is that Pentecost, of course, was the Jewish festival for the celebrating of the law. Where do we get that? We get that from Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember when he receives the law and he comes down the mountain, what does he find? Aaron and all of the people doing what? Worshiping a golden calf. He says, how does this happen? Aaron says, I don't know. <laughs> Through the gold and the fire, out popped a cow. You were lost. What does Moses do? He breaks the Decalogue, the stone tablets. It's a reflection of the broken heart of God. And what happens? He tells the Levites, grab your swords, yeah. go through the camp, and kill every idolatrous worshiper. And if you read the narrative in the book of Exodus, what does it say? And on that day, about 3,000 perished. And you fast forward to Acts 2, and on the day of Pentecost, the celebrating of the giving of the law, the Spirit comes, and instead of death by virtue of the law, life by virtue of the Spirit, 3,000 are saved. So the New good. Testament church is planted. So the church is planted in the flames of revival. And the problem is that we want a first century church, but we don't want a first century ecclesiology. We don't want a first century pneumatology. We don't want a first century concentration or focus. And to me, I just go, this is who we are. It is the heritage of believers. Revival is God's inheritance for his people. If he would find a people who were unwilling to live without it, God would show himself strong. Wow. Okay, so I'm going to follow up on that for the people to contextualize a little bit. So this is the culture that you're creating at Pursuit, which is not just a culture, not just a slogan, not just a tagline, but you're creating carriers of revival. You're, you're, you're shaping them, forming them. Okay, so we've, we've get, we're surrounded by a bunch of Gen Zers. So they walk, they're walking into, or out, into and, and out of college in a different cultural climate, different cultural setting, but with the same mandate. Yeah, yeah. So what would you say to the people surrounding you in this room about what you think needs to happen through them and in them for them to be carriers of revival today? Yeah, it's such a good question. I mean, I think, you know, all throughout Scripture, especially in kind of the, the recapitulated history of, of the nation of Israel, they go through times of immense blessing 
and it makes the people of God casual. They trust in their own power. They end up in idolatry, which leads to bondage. God, in his grace, sends a deliverer, takes them out of bondage into blessing. Blessing comes. It makes them rich. It causes them to plant vineyards and build houses. They lean on their own understanding. They fall into idolatry, back into bondage. It's just kind of this, you know, titular cycle that just repeats itself all throughout history. And so, you know, for me, I think, like, uh, you know, when, when we talk about... Um, the, 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 necessary, the necessary framework or climate for, for revival to exist. You know, if revival was dependent on who was in, who was in the White House, in, in one sense it would be easier because we could just vote ourselves into revival. But the problem is it doesn't. Re- revival has a lot more to do with who's in your house than, than who's in the White House. And so, you know, to me, when I... <clears throat> The reason why God's people fall into idolatry so often is because idolatry never presents itself as such. Um, Idols don't present themselves as such. They present themselves as convenience. They present themselves as relevance. They present themselves as 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 popularity. And it's like we we have traded the eternal for the temporal, and in doing so, missed out on 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 you know the brilliance of what God has invited us into. And so when I think about you know Gen Z, I'm a millennial myself, but when I think about millennials and Gen Z. And, and, and those who will come after them, the, the COVIDians, you know, the, the baby boom during the COVID, the COVID era, is, is this idea that, that God always has to, it, Scripture is more of a mirror into your life than it is a window into somebody else's. Yeah. So the problem is, is that we have a PhD in everybody else's sin, but a GED in our own. <laughs> Write that down. And so we need scripture to function as a mirror because when we allow it to, it becomes a sword that divides bone and marrow and it confronts our own idolatry. It confronts the idolatry of identity. Like this idea that we get to have our own separate, unique, self-determined identity after coming to Christ. No, you don't. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. You gave up the right to self-determine. You gave up the right to self-identify. You gave up the right to choose your own pathology. You gave up the right to be terminally unique. You gave up the right to Google your symptoms and then say that you have a disease that you've never been diagnosed with. You gave up your right to reframe your sexuality around your abuse. You gave up your right. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. And God will not share the throne of your heart with any other idol. And I think the enemy loves idolatry because what it leads to is compromised Christians. Here's the reality. Converts make heaven. Disciples make history. And I think the enemy's okay with you being a convert because if he can control your flame, then you live a minimized life. And so for me, I'm like... And, and we're, we're all on this own journey. I mean, I'm not standing up, sitting up here today and we've made it, we figured it out. It's like... The further we go, the less I know about what we're doing. And the more I've just got to trust God that he's got to show up and, and make me look a lot better than I am. But, you know, for me, like, especially in our culture, there, there are these generational strongmans, generational principalities and powers that if, 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 we, are, if, we, are un, if we are unwilling to confront them for, for whatever reason, whether it's the pressure of the culture around us or the compromise of our own heart within us, what it will lead to is contained Christianity. It leads to, you know, like C.S. Lewis talked about the lion that's, that's chained up versus the lion that's on the loose. And the reality is, is that if Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah, that means he is still rolling in the streets. At his roar, dead men come to life. And by the way, any day's a good day when you've been raised from the dead. But you know, what I'm struck by is the narrative of Lazarus being raised from the dead in the book of John. And, and when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, he does. But then the very next thing he says is, now unwind his grave clothes. And, and to me, this is a very prototypical picture of maybe my generation is that we have come into the, you know, not my entire generation, but segments of our generation. We have come into the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus, but we are still wrapped up by the grave clothes of that which identified us while we were in the tomb. So I've come to Jesus, but I still got my idolatry. I come to Jesus, but I still got my sexual proclivity. I come to Jesus, but I still got my addiction. I come to Jesus, but I still got my religion. I come to Jesus, but still the carbon monoxide of nostalgia still puts me to sleep. I've come to Jesus, but I still got the grave clothes. And that's why community is so important because Lazarus couldn't unwrap himself. He says to Mary and Martha, unwrap him, unwind those grave clothes. And that's what's so beneficial about being in this cauldron of development that you're here at in James River is the reality that you got people around you who are going to love you enough to go, hey, listen, I know you've been saved for 10 years, but you got grave clothes on you, my friend. Come you got to come out of that in order that you may live. Wow. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to piggyback off that one, too. Um, <laughs> so you're leading something. You're, you're, that's, that was a word to the generation. And yet, when you're in the middle of something, you're, you're not only... You said to your staff, okay, is this... Are you, have you gotten comfortable with this? Um, you know, is the church that you can see bigger to you than the church that's inside of you? You're leading. So you're, you're leading... You're, you're trying to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit. And for you, pastorally, personally, as a follower of Jesus, to steward effectively what God has placed in your hand and the calling that he has on your life, what in this season, and it, maybe it's beyond a season. I don't mean to just contextualize it to one season. Right, right. But how do you keep that frame, flame fresh in you yeah, yeah, yeah. so that it's, it's constantly growing? It's... Because, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're pointing to the team and saying, hey, yeah. come on, I'm, I'm going to push on. You know, you're pointing to the people in the church that you're leading. What, what are you doing to steward what God is doing in you yeah. so that you can continue to lead at the bleeding edge of what he yeah. wants you yeah. to do? No, that's, that's great. You know, I, when I survey scripture, um, I'm always struck by the things that um, the authors of scripture invite us into in the sense that we take personal responsibility for. I think oftentimes in the church, it's, it's similar to um, JFK's famous line while he was president. He says, ask not what, you know, the country can do for you, but what you can do for the country. And, you know, from that moment forward kind of dawned this new, you know, political age of, of, of selflessness and service and gratitude. And how can we be a part of building this great narrative um, that, that, you know, we call America. I, I think oftentimes in the church, we make it everybody else's responsibility to do the things that the gospel has invited us to do ourselves. And, and certainly there is this communal aspect and you need the fivefold and pastors and apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and leaders in your life to help instruct you and develop you. But I think sometimes what happens is we develop these kind of codependent relationships on leaders that we idolize and then we make it their fault when our lives go undeveloped. Like if you could just come over to my house and chew up my food and spit it into my mouth and then force me to digest it, then finally I would grow. And the reality is, is that what we do as leaders is what God has done for us is he invites us into developmental journey by which the trajectory of our spiritual destiny has upward mobility. And so, you know, for me, you know, it's like the old axiom, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And, and, and I think sometimes for us in church, uh, and, and I do this too, I've got to fight this temptation as well, is that you, you see and you value and you honor what God has done in other people's lives. And you think to themselves, man, if they could just move into my house, if they could just pastor in my neighborhood, if I could just attend what they have or read the book that they wrote or, you know, do all these types of things, then certainly, certainly I could have what they have. And, you know, what I'm struck by, you know, I think about some of Paul's language in the New Testament. He tells Timothy, you stir yourself. Yeah. Stir yourself. He doesn't say, let me come to you and I'll stir you up. He says, stir your, remind yourself of the words that I spoke over your life. When you were set apart by the elders, they laid hands on you. Remind yourself of those words and go to war for the word come that on. has been spoken over your life. Come stir on. yourself. Yeah. I think what the scripture says, humble yourself under the mighty hand yeah. of the Lord and he will promote in due time. Now you're going to be humbled one way or another, but it's a lot easier to humble yourself than to have to have God humble yourself. <laughs> but I think about these things that we're invited into, but one of the ones that I'm most struck by, I think it comes from the Psalms, this is what David says. He says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What's so interesting about that word delight in the Hebrew is that one of its connotations is this phrase, stay delicate. Wow. Stay yeah, delicate. That's good. Stay delicate before the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And what I love about revival environments is that we get to see like the testimonies of God. You know, my favorite term for, for, for the Ark of the Lord was not the Ark of Covenant, it's the Ark of Testimony. Do you know what was in the Ark of Testimony? It was Aaron's rod that budded. It was the manna. Yeah. It was the tablets. It was the, it was the reminder, hey, we've got to carry us, carry these things with us as emblems. You know, it's almost like this Old Testament picture of communion. Do this in remembrance of me. It was the remembrance of the things that God continues to do in our midst. You know, when there's a rebellion in the wilderness and people are revolting against Moses and Aaron because they're tired of being lost, I call it the world's worst camping trip, 40 years, <laughs> walking in a circle awesome. looking for the promised land. I love what Moses does is he takes the rod of, he, ta he gathers the people and he says, because they're saying, who's gonna be our leader? Who's, who's God's man to be? You know, clearly it's not us because you're lost. And so he said, let's take the rods of all of the leaders. Huh. Let's lay them before the ark of the Lord. And whatever buds by morning, 
will determine who God has put his mantle on for leadership. And Aaron's rod begins to bud the almond branch. Does your life bud when you're laid out before the presence of the Lord? So when David says, stay delicate or delight yourself in the Lord, to me, I think about this and I go, you know, I, I, when, I, when I hear the testimonies this morning, the healings, people getting saved at the info booth to sign up for college, things of that, I'm like, y'all better recognize this is not normal. You are in a move of God. You are in the well of revival. You are living what other people prayed for. What people prayed for died not receiving. You are living in. You are reaping from vineyards that you did not plant. It is the privilege of a lifetime to give yourself to the move of God's spirit. You could be anywhere, but you're in Springfield. You could be anywhere, but you're at James River. And you've got to stay delicate before the Lord that your life would bud. Because at the end of your life, the greatest testament to your resume, it is not your PhD. It is not your skill set. It's not your ability to prophesy or write or, 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 or have the greatest you know, interpersonal skills that anybody has ever seen. Does your life blossom when you're laid out before the presence of the Lord? That is what will qualify you to be on the bleeding edge of a generation. And I feel like we owe the region an encounter with God. Religion has served people bondage. We owe the, we are indebted to the world. You are indebted to Springfield. You are indebted to Generation Z. We owe them an encounter with the living God. The God of Elijah who still answers by fire. That's what our world needs and we are indebted to them. And so for me, I just go, man, does it still move you? Are you still delicate before the presence of the Lord? When's the last time you've wept when you've read the pages of scripture? Does it still move you when you sit in this room and you say, look what the Lord has done, great things for us. And to me, I'm like, that's the key and it's hard to teach, but the reality is, is more is caught than is taught. The apostle John says the anointing has no teacher because you can't teach it, but you can catch it. Yes. You can catch it. Yes. And in an environment like this, you can say, God, allow that thing to be the cry of my heart. And, and I, I don't want to stand up here and say every day for the last 10 years, this has just been who I've been. It's, you know, the Lord has been so kind and so generous and so good and, and, and brought me back to that place of my heart being sensitive before him but we need the word of the Lord to take the heart of stone and make it the heart of flesh that we would have circumcised hearts before the Lord laid bare saying, God, I still want to be sensitive to what you're doing. And for me, I'm just like, we, we've got to break off this idea of professionalism in the sense of Christianity. I'm not, I'm not talking about ex, not being excellent or not being professional, but just you know, pr professional believers, professional Christians who check the boxes and go through the motions. And that's the danger, I think, of being in a church that's growing is it's really easy to dress the part and look the part and raise your hands on the right part of the song and clap when everybody claps and cheers when everybody cheers. But at the end of the day, it is who you are when nobody else is around. When you lay your head on your pillow at night and nobody else is there, does your heart still burn for the things of God? This is what I'm so struck by in Luke 24 as we've got two disciples that are walking home and they haven't heard about the resurrection and all of a sudden a man appears next to them and begins to teach them out of the scriptures. Have you not heard that there was one who must be crucified and raised? And he teaches them out of the scriptures and you know the story. They get to the house and it's in the breaking of the bread that their eyes are open. They realize it's Jesus and he disappears. Yeah. And I love what the disciples say. Did our hearts not burn within us? And I think what we need is a company of burning hearts in our generation hearts that still burn when you're next to the presence of the Lord. And to me, I'm like, that's at the end of the day what your qualification is. When we hire staff at our church, I mean, yeah, I love the education piece and I love how much history you have and the cool things that you have done. But it's like, I tell them, show up on Sunday. I want to see if your heart burns for the things of God. Because if your heart don't burn, it don't matter how well you preach. I want to impart a burning heart into this generation. That by the time I die, people say, you know what? I didn't always agree with what he did. Wasn't the smartest guy in the room. Wasn't the best leader. Wasn't the best boss. But man, when I got next to Russell, something in my heart began to burn. Wow. Here's... Um, it's so interesting because as you started answering that question, I wanted to ask you about people who are in the room and they feel that their heart has maybe grown a little bit cold. And then you, then you just took out your sword and, and 
cut that, cut that up. But I also think there's people in the room, and maybe this is, I think, a little bit of our eyes being too much on ourselves, and I think it's getting harder and harder in terms of the culture around us because there's so much press to look at look at me, and that informs the way we then look in the mirror. And it informs, sadly, the way we view our own calling. And I know here's the fact of the matter is there are, there are students in this room, and they're looking at you and going, I want that. I want to be, I would love to be Pastor Russ. I would love to do what Pastor Russ has done. But then they look at themselves and go, what in the, how, how is that even possible? And, and I think there's a bunch caught up in that. But I wonder if you could just speak to that person in the room who's saying, you know what, I'd like to do something great for God, but I, I, I don't even know where to start. I don't, I don't even know, why, would, why me? How, how me? I could see you. I could see Pastor John. I could see Pastor Russ. But, but me? What would you say to that person? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I love this question because um, I think that that's, even when you're giving language to that, like, that's still how I feel most days. Yeah. And some people, Dr. Joe and I, you, you and I were talking about this on the way here, but sometimes we refer to it as imposter syndrome. This idea of like, not that you're an imposter from like a moral or an ethical perspective, but you're just like, it feels out of place. It feels like it wasn't that many years ago we was just knocking on doors doing political races in King County and now now we're here and now we're seeing this and we're doing these types of things and what I what I found for me is this maybe the greatest source of kryptonite to our generation's soul is promotion before it's time the Lord says I promote in due time yeah. in due time there's seed time and there's harvest yeah. there, 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 there is the timing of the Lord and you know my, uh, I told people I grew up in ministry family, but it wasn't like a successful ministry family. And I don't say that in any way to dishonor my parents' legacy or, or, or anything like that. But it was like, they, we was faithful, but we was in small churches that, you know, many, many ways felt like maybe we were running out of gas and just kind of doing our thing. And, 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 you know, I'd be 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. You know, at that point, it's like you've already started your trajectory. You're the youth pastor, you know, you're the kids pastor, and then you're the youth pastor, and then you're the associate, and then you're the itinerant. And we're just doing nothing, you know. We're just serving God and just doing political stuff. And I'm like, all right, God, if this is what you have for me, you know, I'll do this for the rest of my life. But the Lord actually used the failure of a U.S. Senate campaign that we were working on. We raised like 23 million in 18 months and the polls were good and we thought we we're going to make it and by election night everything crumbled before us and we didn't make it and I had planned to move to Washington DC to work out of the Senate building and and the Lord used that 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 failure in my life to kind of re redirect my trajectory but you, you ever have this experience where and some of you who are now married you, you have had this experience you know exactly what I'm talking about but you was dating a gal or dating a guy and you're praying God make this the one make this the one I know this is the one I know this is the one and then you know you get into it six weeks and it's not the one and you're all upset and they dump you or you dump them and you feel crazy and then the Lord opens the right door you marry the right person and then a few years later you're scrolling through like Facebook or Instagram and you see that old person's profile and you're like thank God that this was not the answer to my prayers you know uh, God is so good, you know. God's a lot better than we deserve, you know what I mean? Like, so, like, he knows, like, the desires of our heart, but also the deepest desires of our heart, you know. And, 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 and I just felt like the Lord had used some of the failures and some of the things of, like, my life to say, hey, Russell, I'm actually addressing, like, you remember in the Chronicles of Narnia where the, where the witch is like, oh, and there's the, there's the rules, and this is the magic, and, the, and Aslan is like, uh, there's deeper magic. And I was there when it was written, you know, and there's like a, there's a deeper desire. There's a deeper passion. There's something that you were created to do while you were formed in your mother's womb. Yes. But promotion in due time is the key. It's like a baby that might get born at five months in the womb. That, that, every baby is a blessing, but you born five months while you're still in your mother's womb. You're in the ICU and you're on life support. You might be born with lifelong difficulties. I mean, that is trauma. That is tragedy. And I feel like for, for, for many of people in, in our environment, it's like we get a taste of, of seeing things and, and we think to ourselves like, all right, like I got to force 
I got to force my own way here. Here's the reality. Any door that you have to force open yourself is a door that you have to keep open yourself. The Lord calls. The Lord sets apart. Yeah, the good. Lord anoints. When that's the good. Lord opens the door, guess what? He'll keep that door open yeah, himself. People try to cancel you, come against you, lying tongues rise against you. The Lord says, I open this door and I'm keeping this door open. Yeah. When you open your own door, you get trapped up in this kind of lifelong context of self-preservation. I've, I, I've got to create my own space. I've got to occupy my own space. I've got to fight for my own space. And the reality is, is when the Lord opens the door, it's the right thing. And so, you know, for me, for, for some of you in this room, it, it's like, it's like my brother got married young and, and, and I ended up getting married young as well. But when he got married, I think I was like 17 or 18. And I was like, my biological clock is ticking. Like it's ticking. I've got to get married. I've got to, uh, I'm going to be alone forever. And we get into this frenzy yeah. of like, I've got to make it happen for me. Yeah. And the reality is, is that the Lord works through divine timing yes. and season. Yes. And he might keep yes. you hidden in a season for 40 years, feeling like all I'm going to do is tend my father-in-law's sheep. But when the Lord says it's time, it's time. Wow. When the Lord says it's time, it's time. One thing I'll bring into this is this, is it's in, you know, Jeremiah. Most people, if, if we're to be honest in this room, we probably know two verses from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, 11, because everybody knows that. And then there's one more, you know, kind of famous where Jeremiah talks about it's chapter 44, 42, 43, something, something around there. He talks about the fire trapped in his bones. You know, it's like a fire trapped in my bones. But you back up a few verses and Jeremiah's complaining to the Lord. He's a prophet. He's trying to speak to the nation. The nation's corrupt. And he's like, it's in me. I carry this word. It's in me. And take away this burden. Take away this burden. Take away this burden. And he says, but Lord, you will not take it away. And then in the King James Version, he says, but I am induced. I am induced. And if I don't let this word out, it's like a fire trapped in my bones. I'm, I'm induced. And I think that it's, a, it's inducing time. <laughs> it's inducing time. But it's the Lord who induces. It's the Lord who induces that dream that's in your heart. Every God-given dream will die in the natural before it lives in the supernatural. And until you've embraced the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping, you're not prepared for the valley of rejoicing unless the seed goes into the ground and first it produces no good thing. And so for me, it's like, I look at that for evidence in people's lives is has the dream that God has given you been offered back to him? You know, that we, 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 we they, they sung it today. You're, you're, you're worthy of it all day and night, you know, before the throne, let incense arise. Well, what's happening day and night before the throne? 24 elders are laying their crowns before him. And every time they get back up, there's another crown on their head, which means if I'll lay it at his feet, he'll double it and put it back on my head. And I'll lay it at his feet and he'll pick it up and put it back on my head. And so when I look at the dream, of God that you're stewarding for, that you're contending for, I'm like, listen, what, where is the evidence of this being laid down to the Lord saying, God, if I'm never known, if I'm never prominent, if I never get the invite to speak, if I never get a full-time job at a church, I will burn for you. You know, when we started the church, we was broke, broke. I tried to play an AG. They wouldn't take me, so I took out a credit card at 23% interest. I went to a place called Guitar Center, bought a karaoke sound system, and we started church in a barn. And so in order to feed my family, I worked in Pest control. Pest control. I worked in crawl spaces cleaning out rat nests and bed bug infestations for three years. All of my sermons were to a captive audience, dead rats, raccoons, and crawl spaces. And the Lord finally got a hold of me in that moment. And he was like, is, if this is the high point of your ministry, is it still worth it? Wow. Is it still worth it? Remember in John 3 when the disciples of John come to him and they're like, Jesus is baptizing more than you. And John's like, I already told you, idiots, I'm not the Messiah. I told you. <laughs> he says, I'm not the bridegroom. Yeah. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Wow. By the way, the one who has the most attention in your heart is the default bridegroom of your life. He says, it's the bridegroom who has the bride. And then he says this, I love this, but I'm a friend. Yeah. And my joy is fulfilled in hearing his voice. Until your joy is fulfilled in hearing his voice, no platform, no ministry invite, no paycheck, no job, no large church will ever be able to fill that void until his voice is enough for you. So, you know, pursuit was not an overnight success. It was the reverse. It was debt. We sold our house, moved in with our in-laws. We qualified for welfare and I worked in pest control. And the church was not an overnight success. It was the reverse of that. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I've made the biggest mistake of my life. You know, ministry is a walk in the park. Nobody tells you it's Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> and that crawl space became my platform yeah. where the Lord got a hold of my heart. And I thought, God, if this is the sweet smelling incense from my life, take it, take it, take it, take it. 
And then the Lord would open a door that no man can close. And so for me, if you're sitting here and you're going, man, I, that's what I want. It's what I'm looking for. And I, I feel a call to full-time vocational ministry. Number one, I'd say if you can do anything else, do it. <laughs> But if there's a fire that's trapped in your bones that you can't get away from, serve the Lord in insignificance until he opens a door. Because in insignificance will do more developmental work in your heart than 14 years in an internship. You need an internship. You need Bible call for sure, for sure. But you need to embrace the insignificance of not being seen, not being complicated, co compli complimented, not being celebrated, and saying, God, if this is all I have, if all, if all I am is a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, better is one day in your court than a thousand elsewhere. If all I do is vacuum the foyer, I've got the best seat in the house. My joy is fulfilled. My heart is fulfilled. My identity is settled. And when God finds that type of heart, that's a platform that he can trust with his indwelt anointing. That's what we need in our generation. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.